<clears throat> hey, uh, if you are joining us today as a guest, we're so glad you're here. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different today. We actually do this uh, at, usually about twice a year here at the Commons. And uh, we're going to do it today. What we're going to do is we're going to take open questions. Uh, we're going to sing several more songs, and then we're going to kind of look at those together, kind of as just a discussion point. So I just wanted to give you kind of a, a little bit of a um, structure for what's going to happen today. Basically, in just a second, uh, there's going to be a phone number that comes up during the next three songs. Um, and it's a Google Voice number, which means that the, the text message questions that come in will be completely anonymous, don't know who they're from. And we want to basically have the crazy and probably really bad idea of any possible question you could throw out there. It could be about life, God, theology, it doesn't matter. You, you pick the subject. Um, and the hope is that we can just have some really great discussions on those things. I was, um, and another hope I have personally is to maybe even discover some new questions that we haven't thought of before. I was over at Safeway just about an hour ago and I was walking through the parking lot and I saw a bumper sticker and it said, um, four out of five cannibals prefer Hefe's tattoos than any other tattoo artists. And I didn't, I didn't even know that tattoos tasted different to cannibals. So any question goes, anything's wide open. I obviously don't have the answers to those things. We just want to start some dialogues. And this is key. I want you to hear this. When we leave today, we really encourage you to go be together and discuss these things uh, further. Now, another note is if you're a parent and you have children in here, because any question is available, you might consider whether or not you want them to be here the whole time as we discuss the answers on some of those things because uh, I'm pretty shady and you don't know, I'm kind of a loose cannon. You don't know what I'm going to say. I just want to make that very evident from the upfront so you can't blame me if your kid has some crazy question for you to get back. So here's the thing though, this doesn't work um, without you. And that's actually what I like the most about this is it's, and we don't do it every week, um, but I like it a couple times a year because it's so interactive. We get to hear from you with the questions that you want to hear about and think about and those kind of things. So here's what's going to happen right now. Um, after I pray for our time together in our worship, uh, right after that, Laura and Michelle and Hannah are going to come up and share a little bit about what's been going on since they last shared with you a little bit about their vision and a couple other announcements. So let me pray for our time together and then you guys start texting some, some tough questions. So let's pray. God, thank you. Um, God, I'm so thankful um, that you can handle questions. I'm thankful just personally and selfishly that in my life, it, my dad taught me that it was okay to ask you really, really hard questions, God, that you can handle it. And Lord, I just pray today, God, as we just try to discuss and look at some of the things that give us uh, questions and confusion, Lord, I just pray that you give us clarity and pray that you help us get a step closer to truth about life, who we are, who you are, how you feel about us. And I just pray that you'll bless this time. This is very open-ended. So I just pray that you um, put the right questions in our minds right now. I pray for this time of worship that it will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm going to begin uh, by praying for another church in town. As we always do, that's a tradition. We believe strongly that we're just one tiny piece of a much bigger church. And today we're going to pray for Grace Fellowship and Joe, their pastor, the Grace Fellowship. And I lift up their time and our time together. So let's pray. God, thank you. Um, thank you so much for our family that meets over at Grace Fellowship. And Joe, God, and his leadership. And just the years of service of just telling people about your love. Um, and Lord, we just pray that you bless them. That they'll grow stronger and stronger in you every day. And that you'll bring us closer to them and each other. And Lord, we also pray for this time today um, that you will be in this, God. That we'll just start some ideas and discussions that at the end of the day, God, will just draw us closer to you. That's truly my prayer, God. All this questions and all the things that we have, Lord, please let it draw us closer to who you are. We love you and thank you for the freedom we have to ask hard questions. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. You did really well. And because of our little uh, gaffe with the uh, phone number, I literally only had time to write down jotted versions of your questions as fast as I could. And so I'm going to be making this up as we go. So there is a certain silliness to this that I want you to be aware of. And if you've been here before and we've done one of these, I always kind of give this disclaimer. But I want you to recognize how ridiculous I know this is for a couple of reasons. One, first of all, just put yourself in my shoes for just a second. And let's say you are a PhD of thermodynamics or something like Brent. You probably know a lot about something. Um, well, the, the truth is, if we got Brent up here, he would know a lot about thermodynamics, um, which is really cool, and, and heat transfers, things that I don't know a lot about. These questions are all over the board, and I have a PhD in none of them. 
And so there is a ridiculousness to this, but here's my hope, and I want you to hear this really clear. My hope is it will begin some dialogue, and you can see from one person's perspective who's trying to follow Jesus how some of these questions are dealt with and answered. They, you're going to see, are across the board. And by the way, they are going to be a little graphic, so I would say uh, thanks for that. Uh, so if you want to get your kids out of here, you might really consider doing that as a second warning. Uh, but here's the thing I really want you to hear. This is important, because this is a little bit different, I think, than the way the church has sometimes come across If you came in here today and you see these questions come in and then I give my perspective on these questions and you believe everything that I say about these questions, there's a very good chance you are susceptible to joining a cult. You should never, ever believe everything that one person says. I I can only talk from my perspective and here's what I really, really, really want you to hear. It's completely okay to disagree with me especially on these things. We're going to be talking about mostly what I consider tertiary issues. We're not going to be talking a ton about my favorite subject, the true gospel. We'll talk a little bit, the good news of who Jesus was, our hope that we have in him, that what God has revealed to us is the hope that our life can be fulfilled in a relationship with Jesus. That's not going to be the main point of today's message because your questions weren't about that. Maybe next service they will be. We'll see. But these are very tertiary issues, but... They are important. Now, I had great questions. Uh, One came in about 30 seconds before I walked here about if we're ever gonna have a Commons Fantasy Football League. Um, And that person also talked a little bit of trash that they would win that league. Uh, So you know, we actually have done that before and no one signed up and I wasn't bitter about that at all. Um, But just to give you a little background. Here's where I wanted to start though. Um, there's, this is basically mass chaos. I literally have jotted them down on a piece of paper. I'm gonna try to lump as many questions as I can that are similar together. And there's not gonna be a real organized flow to it, but I did think it would be logical to start with one question that begins at the very beginning. One of the greatest questions that came in by far today, I think I will say it is the greatest question is, who created God? And then following that, they said, because in the picture with Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, God the Father has a belly button. And uh, I thought that was the greatest question that's ever been texted in here at the comments. Now, I have actually been in the Sistine Chapel. I've seen that belly button. And I would say that if your source of all truth in life is the paintings of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, you're, you're starting from the wrong place probably. But the question is enormous and great. Who created God? What happened at the beginning? Now, typically, you know, the great thing is also, by the way, we all come from very different backgrounds. We have different perspectives walking in here today, but there is this beginning point that that affects our whole worldview. Is there a God? What happened at the beginning? And there's all sorts of fancy philosophical and theological terms like the cosmological argument and the ontological argument that all have to do with the very beginning, the teleological argument. I'm not going to outline all of those. We've actually done that before in separate times, but the idea that I want you to hear about from the very beginning that I believe is relevant mostly to a materialistic worldview is this. The very best science we have today is telling us that everything came ex nihilo, the Latin term that means from nothing. That at some point, probably about 14 billion years ago in that range, there was nothing and then there was everything. Now that's just a tiny little glass to look through called our modern scientific worldview. Now humans have asked this question for a long time without any scientific evidence to know anything about the origins or the beginning, what we call cosmology. But even from the very first Western thinkers, when you think 600 years before Christ and you start looking at Aristotle and Plato and the Hellenistic thinkers, the first philosophers, Aristotle was the one that talked about the prime mover. There seems to be some sort of intelligence behind everything that we see. Now, what I'm talking about is two very important opposing worldviews. There's a theistic or a deistic worldview that says there is some sort of intelligence or perhaps even person behind the scenes of what we see in nature. Now, here's the interesting thing. And I, I love, uh, and this will, some of this you guys will just tune out on, but I love theoretical physics. I love reading the most cutting edge um, atheist philosophies on string theory and all sorts of different things with cosmology of what ideas we have about the beginning. But what I can tell you is at the very beginning, the most atheistic agnostic friends of ours who study science slip into religious language because there is no way to describe the power of what we see in 14 billion light years and maybe even seeing beyond that now as to where the beginning was. So I would say that I agree with the early Greek thinkers, there's a prime mover, but the question, that's far from a Christian God, that's a whole other question. Now, what I would love to do is spend the next 25 minutes going through what I call my own Christian apologetic. 
I'd like to walk through the defense of my faith and, and where I go by looking at the moral law. In fact, C.S. Lewis, as you, many of you know, had a huge influence on me on looking at the nature of man, all sorts of things. But you guys didn't ask those questions, so I'm going to stay focused here. I'm going I'm to try to get back on the thing. Now, this is a random tangent, but this is a huge one that gets asked every single time. But it only was a couple questions today, so I'm going to give you the mini version. The question was about predestination. Uh, the idea that God... Um, foreknows or more importantly chooses the fates of all human beings now um, in the materialistic world this is called determinism it's not this is not just a question for theologians and christians um, everyone has to re wrestle with is everything in our life planned out for us ahead of time do we have free will and all i'm going to do to give you a very short answer about this is christians heavily disagree about the concept of free will and predestination a couple years ago we did a series called the spectrum and we did a whole message where we kind of drew out on the stage here the spectrum of what different followers of Jesus, how they handle this topic. People who believe that the Word of God, that the Bible is the truth about these things, who disagree about what the Word of God says. On one end of the spectrum, we have what I would call hyper-Calvinists, people who believe that in double predestination and that God chooses everything and there's no human free will whatsoever. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have this idea that it's all free will and God Himself may not even do anything sovereign other than knowing all the factors that are going to go into the conclusion. And here's what I want to tell you on a, just a personal opinion. This stuff is going to have very little to do with how much you've reconnected with your Father in Heaven. The, the truth, the non-negotiables that Christianity for 2,000 years have come around together about who God is, has very little to do with these very fun, by the way, philosophical things to think about. And by the way, there's a kind of a third tangent of a triangle called open theism that, that different scholars would believe. But here's the bottom line. I believe personally the Bible teaches all of those things. I can go to Romans 9 and Ephesians 2 and I can walk you through and show you how if God is sovereign and he knows all things, then he must in some way be completely sovereign and be responsible for the choices of all men. But I can also show you throughout the Bible the, imp the very implied choice from the very beginning chapters of the Bible. The, the whole story of the Garden of Eden is about choice. Everything that's spoken to us in 27 books of the New Testament is about how we respond and how we're supposed to go tell people so that they can make choice. And all I'm saying is I believe in some strange mystery that my tiny little brain will ever understand. It's all true. God is sovereign. And there is an image of God, Imago Dei, stamped on our little human selves, whatever we are, that has some sort of choice like God. And it's a beautiful mix. I, uh, some of you are probably going to hate that answer, but that's fine. Next thing. This is a good one. This one said, in the process of conversion, or the idea of becoming a Christian, converting into saying, I, I didn't believe in Jesus, and, and now I do believe in Jesus, or, or transforming, when does that conversion ever end? When am I fully Christian, or when do I know that I'm a Christian? I thought this was a wonderful question. Very authentic, very sincere, probably very personal to someone who sent it in. Um, and I've had the same questions myself in my own faith journey, is trying to figure out this strange tension between, okay, is there a moment where I'm in? Now I'm a Christian, I wasn't before. And to be honest with you, I still have some tension with some of these things. But here's some of the things that I know to be true. And I've learned some of this, by the way, through some of the doctrine of predestination, some of the good things of the reformers that they've passed. But here's what I really lean into. First of all, I know that my salvation, my knowing Jesus, and knowing that I'm ultimately in and going to be restored forever with Jesus, has very little to do with me. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. In my early Christian years, um, when I was a young child, I, I love when Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. I was like that. I reasoned like a child. And for me, I had a very simplistic view of religion. Religion was a set of rules, and I had to attain a certain level of these rules, and then I could please God, and I would be in. Now, most of us, if you've been around any healthy Christian church, know that that's, that's the enemy. That is not the truth of the gospel. The truth is, the reality is, all of us... Whether we believe in God or a complete materialist, we all subscribe to some sort of moral standard. And if you disagree with me, I ask you if you've ever been in an argument about anything in your life. You're going to apply, you're going you're gonna to reason with the person you're arguing with that they have faulted you in some way to some invisible standard that you both know exists. The idea of right and wrong. And I believe with all my heart, every human, no matter what their worldview knows, that there is a difference between right and wrong. Now, there are people who very vehemently oppose that idea and say there is no, that they're uh, non-dualists to the extreme saying that there is no good or evil. It's all the same thing. It's all one. But the reality is nobody lives that way. 
we all live in such a way that there's an invisible standard. And that's point one. Point two is we know that we don't live up to that. Every human being knows that we are not in, we're not in harmony with this moral standard that is invisibly written onto all of us. Now, that's just from a thinking standpoint. From a biblical standpoint, that's exactly what Christianity teaches. All of us, all of us have gone astray like sheep. In fact, Romans says no one, not one. There's not one human being who is righteous before God. And since the kids aren't in here, I'll tell you one of my favorites. In Isaiah, it says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. And the reason I'm going to, wait, there's a child. <laughs> Close your ears. Plug your ears. <laughs> because here's what I want to tell you. The, the Hebrew word that Isaiah wrote right there, the Hebrew word is menstrual cloths. He said all of the good things that we can sum up in our life, add it together, compare that to God, and it's like used menstrual cloths. That's some vivid adult imagery. I love the Bible because it's very adult. But the truth is, that is true of all of us. All of us have gone astray. None of us live up to the moral code. But the message of Christianity has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with that God fixing the problem, taking our place, making a way so that we can be forgiven for the fact that we don't live up to that moral standard. So this is just the very beginning of this question of conversion. And the very beginning is, you don't really convert into God as much as He has converted us. He paid the price for us. But here's the great question. I love this. Theologians call this sanctification. It's something that Christian churches, unfortunately, have split over the years because it's hard to understand. There's the idea of justification. And that means once we recognize and receive this free gift of God that Jesus died in our place or that Jesus conquered over sin and death, once we've entered into that, we are justified, which is easily remembered by just if I had never done it. He sees us as white as snow, yet we know we continue to sin. And by sin, I mean just do things that separate us from God. We're not the best version of ourselves. So sanctification is a whole other word, and I think that's kind of what this question has to do with. When do I become fully Christian or converted? And the answer is not in this lifetime. There is no Christian that's 85 years old that is now perfect. They're still in the process of being sanctified. And the message of the gospel that these first century Palestinian authors would understand is rooted in this very controversial, world-shocking idea of resurrection. The idea that one day we will be resurrected just like the first picture, Jesus, God himself, was resurrected. Until that day, none of us will be perfect, but we will be justified by God's love. So to whoever it is that asked this question, if you've accepted the free gift of God's love, you're in, if you're looking for an in and out term, you're covered, you're free, you're white as snow, it's just as you've never sinned, and now we get to go about the great business of living. We get to live life to the full and try to be sanctified and try to finally become the best version of ourselves. Great question. All right, everybody, buckle up. We're about to, we're about to go there. Get your metaphorical seatbelts on. Um, I would love to avoid this question, but there was way too many that came in. So there was uh, lots and lots of questions r around the idea of homosexuality and sex. So we're going to talk about it. Uh, the questions varied. In fact, they were beautiful in the way in which they were framed. There was um, some of the very logical arguments that if we are knit together in our mother's womb, and if people are born gay, does God make people gay? Maybe the simple version that some text in it, is homosexuality a sin. Some said, how do I walk through with a friend who is living a homosexual lifestyle and yet is trying hard to follow Jesus? Now, let me just say, I just lumped all those things together and they're all vastly different questions. Now, here's where I want to give you a major disclaimer before I begin. Are you ready for this? This is the topic of our day. You don't need to be told that. This is huge. And when you walked into this room today, you were on a team. Um, you already have a preconceived notion about what you believe about homosexuality. Um, you have opinions, ideas. You probably still have questions like I do. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is what is a biblical and a Christian worldview about this. Now, I often feel like when I've talked about this before, I used to, when I was in college, I refereed basketball games. In some ways, that's the best job in the world. Travel a lot. It's great. Um, on the other hand, it's pretty obvious that being a referee is pretty much the worst job in the world. Because no matter what you do, every time you blow your whistle, half of the stadium hates you. And this is interesting because I actually gave this analogy last time I addressed this question. And I told you that the answer I was going to give was actually going to tick off everybody in the room. And I was right. For the next three weeks, I had lunch meetings and coffees and phone calls with both sides of the spectrum who were vehemently angry with me. 
From the liberal side, I was too conservative. From the conservative side, I was too liberal. And so I just want you to know I'm about to tick you off. So you just need to know that ahead of time. But what I'm going to talk about is my perception of this issue of homosexuality. And I really want you to hear this. It's okay if you disagree with me. You're still welcome here. You might be right. You might be able to convince me otherwise. But I'm going to tell you how I see it and how I think the Bible talks about this. One of the questions I thought was really enlightening it said in the Old Testament, which is filled with polygamy and abuse and all sorts of things, it talks about homosexuality. Why do we still think homosexuality is a sin? Where are these other things we've just let go as different? Now, I would say that is a wonderful question. And people who don't recognize how difficult the Old Testament is when it comes to the things it talks about morally have never read the thing. It's crazy. It's full of incestual homosexuality and murderous things. And it's very difficult to understand. And I would say with that person, I agree with you 100%. And I, don't, I hope this doesn't offend you, but I don't really care. I'm not going to build my moral argument over what Leviticus says about homosexuality. Because it also might have you stone a woman for having her menstrual period in the wrong place. So it's not exactly the place. We're looking at a historical document that tells us the truth about God's people, which ultimately is a revelation that Jesus fulfilled. We're going to talk about the whole Old Testament in a second because someone else asked about it. But it is not a source to find every literal phrase and say that's where we draw our morality from. That would be a problem. Sodom and Gomorrah is often used as an example of how homosexuality is a sin. I disagree. I don't see Sodom and Gomorrah being about homosexuality. It's about a lot of weird stuff on top of about angels and man, crazy stuff. Not about homosexuality. So if the whole question was it's in the Old Testament, then I would say, oh, this is easy. We don't have to really look at that. The problem is, what do the New Testament texts say about it? And I've given my personal adult life to figure out why I believe these texts to be valid at all. Did these people write these things or did they know Jesus? Did they go to their death saying these things are true? And I want to point out a couple things. I'll start here. I think the question of, in the simplest form, is homosexuality a sin, is loaded in every way. First of all, what do you mean by homosexuality? Second of all, what do you mean by sin? Okay, homosexuality is a huge term that includes a lot of different stuff and you all have different pictures in your mind. I think it's helpful to separate out the idea between sexual orientation and sexual behavior. Now, I personally believe, I believe that science tells us, I believe that reason tells us that people are born sexually oriented towards the other, to the same gender. Now, I've, I've seen it I, I, in animals, it's certainly true, we can't deny biology, I had sheep that were born that they just wanted to be with dudes, dudes and dudes. That's how they did it. And that's, that's the thing. Now, here's the question. I, I'm very bothered with modern Christianity because modern Christianity wants to fight that battle. Modern Christianity wants to say, no, you weren't born that way. It's all a choice. And I think we're, if we're reasonable people, we'll recognize that it's a mixed bag. We make choices and we have orientations. But here's the key. Whether we're born gay or not is completely irrelevant. I believe we are. I also believe that we're born with genetic predisposition to alcoholism. I also believe that we're born with predispositions like me personally, I've used this analogy before, with a predisposition towards polygamy. See, I, I believe with all my heart the animal self of me, the way Charlie was born, was to see girls that I want because I think they're beautiful and then I would like to have sex with them. That's the way I was born. But here's the thing. I don't draw my morality from my nature. See, if I was going to go to nature for morality, I would go to praying mantises and watch them eat their children's heads and say, well, maybe it's okay to eat the heads of our children. But see, we don't go to nature for morality. I think we can recognize that there is some sort of invisible moral law out there that we, we don't think we're quite living up to. But the question is, how do we know what that is? And that's where Christianity comes into play. What does it tell us about homosexuality. Now, here's where people can rightfully disagree with me. I know a lot of you are uncomfortable. I know I am. Whew. Here's how you could disagree. Christians do disagree about this. There are Christian people, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, I personally believe homosexuality is a sin. Let me define sin a little bit. Does, do I think homosexuals are going to hell? No. Do I think people who are practicing homosexual have no way of following Jesus? No. So don't, don't load or presuppose in your mind anything that you hear from culture. But I do believe that the Bible in the New Testament is clear that it's not the best version of ourselves, even if we're born that way. In fact, interestingly enough, being born that way would validate what the Bible tells us about us. The Bible is very clear that we are all born in some sort of way that's not going to be the best version of ourself, which is huge. Now, what is sin? Now, this is, this is, my, this is my soapbox about homosexuality. Sin is not an identity. 
And that's what I think is the most fascinating about the current conversation about homosexuality. Homosexuality becomes the whole of who a person is. I am a homosexual. Well, I am a luster. I lust. I'm prideful. I'm filled with pride and arrogance, but it's not who I am. It doesn't define who I am. Or let's even take it on the positive side instead of the negative. Let's say I, I play basketball. Does that mean I am a basketball player that is the sum of who I am? And I think that's one of the interesting things about this question of homosexuality in our current dialogue is this idea of your sexual orientation, who you are to the core, or is it an orientation, the way you're born, the leaning that you have. Now, I think that this question could go deeper and deeper and deeper because one of my favorite questions people ask me all the time is they say, well, so what are you saying? It's, it's wrong that two men can't love each other? I say, no, I, I love lots of men. And, and then they say, well, what is it wrong for two men to, or two women to romantically love each other? And I said, I don't know. I, I have very limited resources other than what I believe to be the truth about who we are and who the best version is. And it says that having sex with someone of the same gender is not going to be the most glorifying thing. By the way, side tangent, if you're a complete Darwinist materialist worldview, and I'm a big fan of evolution, by the way, but if that's your whole worldview, do you, under, you do understand that homosexuality is an aberration to natural selection. Now, this is just science. If that's your true worldview, the, the idea of procreation is the most important process of survival of the fittest in any species changing and going on. So it's important to recognize that within that worldview, it would be a greater sin if you define sin in terms of the progress of evolution. Now, here's the thing. It's just a sin. It's no different than my sin, which I am filled with, and I am following Jesus. This is the thing that drives me crazy. I don't see any difference whatsoever because Jesus made it very clear that if I even look at a girl, one of the most difficult things that I wish Jesus hadn't said, he said, if you even look at a girl and lust after her, you have already committed adultery in your heart. Well, guess what? I do it all the time. It's part of who I am, if you want to talk in those terms. I was born that way. I don't believe it's the very best for me, though. As much as I wish Jesus hadn't said it, it's been a challenge for me that has brought me life as I've tried hard to go against my nature and live in a morality that I believe came from somewhere outside of nature. It was revealed that the best version of me would be if I can just focus on the love of my life, who I love dearly, Marka. So I found that to be a true process. Now, please hear me on this. This is a discussion point. Leave here, and if you, anybody, represents Christianity in such a way that Christians hate homosexuals or homosexuals are going to hell, then I would say you need to speak up. You need to get into that discussion and say that's not true. It's just one piece of a picture that all of us are part of. All of us are separated from God. All of us have one hope of looking more like Jesus and following him. So next question on sex, because we're not done yet. Is sex outside of marriage? Okay. You know, this is kind of interesting because if you've grown up in a Christian home or a religious home, you've been taught your whole life this is the greatest sin on earth and you're, you've been given promise rings and you're, your whole goal in life is to be a virgin until you're married. Which, by the way, I say that tongue-in-cheek and those are all wonderful things. In fact, I did that. I grew up in that home and I waited until I was married. And it doesn't matter if you didn't. There's still lots of grace and forgiveness. But my point is this. It's not the major theme of the Bible. It is very clear, kind of like homosexuality, which also, by the way, is not a major theme of the Bible. How many times did Jesus say homosexuality? Zero. We have no recorded saying of Jesus where he mentions homosexuality. So I would offer to say I hate that we would even spend this much time of our conversation about something that is not the main theme of what Christianity is about. And sex outside of marriage is the same way, but it does teach us biblically what the very best is. It does draw the line and lets us know that sex was created to be amazing. And it is amazing. Amazing, And it's at its best and safest and most incredible place in a committed, full relationship. I can tell you because I've had a lot of sex. I'm really proud of that. I brag about it all the time. I have four kids, but I could have 4,000 kids easily. Now, here's the thing. Here's what I know about that. I know because of my decade of sex, okay, I know that it is not what you see in the movies. And married people know this. It is so much more beautiful. It's so much more intimate. It has times of crying and hurting each other and joy and ecstasy. It was dreamed up by a very creative God. And it was dreamed up in a place where it is safe, 
Where the intimacy and the hurt and the joy and the ecstasy of sex comes in a place of unconditional love that will never be broken. The Bible stands for that, and I agree with it. Did Jesus make the Old Testament irrelevant? Um, and I would say no, first of all. In fact, Jesus answered this question. He said, not one jot or tittle. Those are Hebrew words. In fact, if you study Hebrew, um, there, there was these characters you read from right to left, opposite of us. And then they went in and they added these little vowel marks. Those are called jot or tittles. And Jesus said, not one of those things will be removed or abolished because of me. I came to fulfill the Old Testament. Now, this one saying of Jesus makes it very clear that he's not throwing out the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not garbage. What he's saying is, and this shocked his listeners, that whole thing is about me. He's saying, I fulfill that. And the way I like to say this is, I look at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. Because without the lens of Jesus, the thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me, to be totally honest with you. But Jesus makes it make sense. From the very beginning, with lambs being sacrificed, to the flood and baptism, everything ultimately turns out to have been about Jesus. It all makes sense when we look back, understanding God's redemptive plan. And I think that's really important to have what I call a Christocentric view of the Old Testament. Now, a more specific question came in that said, how do you take things like the flood or the Tower of Babel, which seem to be allegorical, and yet they seem to be written as history? People are going to disagree about this, and they disagree within Christianity. I personally could not care any less, to be honest with you. I do not care if the flood covered the entire earth or the region of the world that they were in at that time. It makes absolutely no difference to me as to what those authors are communicating about sin being washed away in a baptism of the earth and resurrection. To me, it doesn't matter. Now, do I think that the Bible is good history, the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures? By the way, don't say Old Testament if you're hanging out with Jewish friends. It's offensive. It's the Jewish scriptures and we have the Christian scriptures. But the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures... Uh, I think they're also good history. There's a ton of archaeology that backs up so much of what we have learned and seen. Now, here's what I want you to hear more than anything, because I think this question is very relevant for a lot of people. One thing I've noticed about American Christianity, in fact, a couple times ago we did this, somebody asked, what do you think the greatest problem in the American church? One of the things I've noticed is we've had 150 years of influence in America of a way of interpreting the Bible that's called a fundamentalist historical way of interpreting it. Now, here's the problem with that. What that means is every single thing is completely literal history. A couple problems with that. One, you've built a house of cards. When one card falls out, it's possible that your whole house of cards collapse. There's a very famous agnostic textual critic. His name is Bart Ehrman. He's had a huge influence in a negative way in our world, persuading people that the New Testament documents weren't exactly what they seemed to be. And it's all because Bart Ehrman, who was a fundamentalist Christian, who went to Christian seminaries in Wheaton and Illinois and and taught at churches, his whole house of cards crumbled one day because he found out that there was a part of Mark at the very ending that we don't know for sure if John Mark wrote that or not. So for him, his whole heart, his whole card class collapsed. Now, the interesting thing is, as he further down that journey has written books and sold millions and millions of copies, he will himself testify of the three places in the New Testament that are questionable, and they are, and we should teach that from our pulpit. Well, there are three spots in the New Testament that I really don't believe the authors wrote those things, but they have nothing to do with Christian doctrine. I say throw them out. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything about the story of who Jesus is or Christian theology or anything like that. And by the way, they might be true. It might have been the early church saying, oh, we also know this story about Jesus is true. And they stick that little piece in there. But the problem is when you have a house of cards of faith and you believe that if you find out somewhere that the flood only covered a region of the world, well, then Christianity is not true. Well, that's not what that book's about. Or if you believe that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are so ingrained in a 7, 24-hour period that if you find out that that's not true and that the earth might be older than six to 10,000 years old, then the house of cards collapses. Well, guess what? That's not true. Because it's crazy to think that a song written by a Hebrew person in Psalms was supposed to be history. It's not. It's a song. Or a poem was supposed to be history. It's not. It's a poem. But there are specific pieces which are specific history. And we should say, that's the best evidence we have of what this people group wrote down as their history. It's probably what happened. And it's important to know that Genesis at the very beginning is a song. And it's a poem. And it is absolute truth. I believe with all my heart it is the truth of God. And it is about who created us, this prime mover. And why he created us. What we're like. What happened when that choice went wrong. That's what Genesis 1 is about. By the way, 
the sun was created on day four. So it makes it really difficult to have seven little 24-hour periods if the sun wasn't there up until that point. Another nice transition. Forgiveness. There's a lot of questions about forgiveness. Um, and I'll try to fly through these because they're difficult. And I'm so sorry because I know each of you wrote these questions in and it's a personal thing. And, and I know it's so fast. This, again, this is the ridiculousness of this format. Someone said, how can I forgive myself? Um, even though I know God has long forgiven me. I, I don't know. There's so many questions that I could lump in together that how can I stop sinning? How can I change who I am even though I know the truth about God? And all I can say is lean hard into God. If you know that, the person who wrote this question, I got the sense knew that God has forgiven them, but they just couldn't forgive themselves. Well, why don't you just start trusting God's version of you instead of your version of you? Now, I know that's cliche and easier to say than to do because I've been in the same place. It's very difficult. Another one came in that said, when should we forgive others and when should we stand up and fight? When, when should we forgive and forget and when should we stand up and fight? Well, to me, um, that's a very simple concept. Um, we always stand up and fight. To me, one of the greatest things about Christianity is the virtues of Christianity are courage and strength. Jesus was powerfully strong. He fought against religious people who tried to paint God in a way that wasn't loving and true. He stood up and fought all the time, but he was always filled with forgiveness. The, the thing is actions and heart. Like if you're, for example, let me give you an extreme case. If you're a wife and you're being abused, stop it. Get, get away from it. Not stop it, you're not doing it, but get away from it. Stand up and fight. Get out of there. There's no place. It's not forgiving and forgetting to let someone beat you up. That's not forgiveness. That's idiocy. And, and I, I apologize if you're in that place because it's, I can understand being broken and, and having that hard journey. But we're not to be doormats that are walked upon. That's not the Christian message. The Christian message is, hey, we're all messed up. We all do horrible things. And I could even forgive a husband that beat me up, but not while he's beating me up. At that time, maybe, maybe you could have forgiveness in your heart, but you're going to get out of that situation. So Christians should stand up and fight, but then we should have, and this is what's the most counterintuitive to our animal nature, forgiveness like Jesus. He forgave people who ripped the flesh off of his back. He was God. He had a leg up on us. But that's who we're following. That's who we're going to be like. Forgiveness, here's the thing, frees you, not the other person. Because when we're bitter and we won't let go of something, we won't let it go, you're out of the situation, it's a cancer that grows inside of you. Hatred that steals your life, not their life. Forgiveness a lot of times is to set yourself free from what's going on. Here's an interesting one that came in. It says, why does Jesus keep putting people in our life who hurt us, specifically step-parents? I like the specificity of that. Um, I, I don't personally believe, I, I think there's a little bit of mixed up theology or philosophy into this question. I mean, what's presupposed in this question is that everything in our life, Jesus himself put into your life as a test. In fact, that's another question that came in. Does God test us with things? And I think the reality is, I personally think that that's a little bit of a warped view. Because when you start looking at the problem of pain, the problem of suffering, you're going to get into really tough territory if you believe that Jesus personally put your step-parents in your life. No, we live in a real world where real consequences happen. And your step-parents might be evil people. I don't know. I don't know who wrote this question. And Jesus is not evil. He didn't put them in your life. He gives hope that any of us in any situation can go to him for help in the darkest of situations. There is a way to go to Jesus, but he is not the one who initiates the evil in our life. It's the evil of other people. In fact, that's probably one of the most important frameworks to the question of the problem of evil or a problem of suffering is the idea that at least, you know, pick a number, 70% of it is caused by human free will. Now, it's a greater question that it goes beyond just what bad people do because there's certain things that happen because of tsunamis and things like that. But unfortunately, none of you asked about the problem of pain, so we're, you're not going to get to go into that today. Um, last question right here. Who's hearing us in the Trinity? Is it Jesus, the Holy Spirit? Is it the Father? It's God. Um, we get a little bit mixed up when we get into this polygamous religion where it's more three gods than one. Now, there is certainly distinct personalities. The Trinity is one of the hardest things to possibly understand. But I, I've had friends of mine that say, you can't pray to Jesus, you have to pray to the Father because Jesus prayed only to the Father. And I'm like, yeah, but he also said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and the interesting thing is the earliest documents in the New Testament, the earliest ones from the first century, which are incredible, they actually interchangeably use Jesus and God the Father. In fact, at one point in James, it actually says that Jesus did something in the Old Testament. Just absolutely interchanges Jesus' names in the earliest manuscript for God. They're the same thing. Question. 
is the God of creation the supreme God? Now, it's interesting because this was a very important question in the first couple of centuries in Palestine. Not, not in the very first century, not when the, the apostles lived and the gospels were written and Paul wrote his letters, no big deal. But in the second century, uh, this very famous thing you might have heard of called Gnosticism popped up. And this is exactly what Gnosticism taught. Gnosticism is just a fancy word. It's from the Greek word for knowledge. That The idea of Jesus being real wasn't the thing. He was some spiritual entity. And the way Gnosticism dealt with the problem of evil or the problem of pain, which I'm surprised not many of you asked about today, is they dealt with it by saying this. Everything, they were very hardcore, extreme dualistic. They believed that everything material was evil. And everything that's spiritual or non-material is not evil. By the way, make, make this clear. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about Gnosticism, which the early church in the first few hundred years had to be very careful to make sure that didn't get wired into the main message of who Jesus was historically and, and literally and true. So this, this message came forth that everything that is tangible and touchable is evil. Therefore, the creator God must be some sort of evil God that created the material world. And there must be a higher supreme being. A couple problems with that. One, I'd like to present to you, we come from different backgrounds. Some of you believe the Bible is God's word. Some of you hate Christianity. It's a, it's a hodgepodge of people here. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And there's reasons that we're going to get into a little bit why we believe the Bible to be a valid source of truth of any kind. But the Bible is very clear that there is one God. In fact, if you miss that theme, you have never read the Hebrew, the Hebrew Scriptures. The 39 books, what we call the Old Testament. One thing is imminent throughout those books. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There is one God. And by the way, on a secular perspective, that is also true of the God of philosophy. From the early days, 600 years before Jesus, from Aristotle thinking of the prime mover, uh, to Plato, to all the way throughout time, secular philosophers who try to wrap their mind around some sort of mind behind creation have come to the idea of deism or theism. It has nothing to do with Christianity, but would also agree that there has to be a God that is personal and intellectual and above all else. Now, that doesn't mean it's the God of Christianity by any means, but, but reasonable people, because of these arguments that I don't want to go into huge, but the cosmological and the teleological argument, these, the ontological argument, reasonable philosophies can come to a place of saying there is some sort of power prime mover God that's intellectual and personal behind and supreme and outside of nature. And that's really key. And this is one thing I love. Nature, science, the very best science today is confirming for the first time in recorded human history that everything came from nothing. The Latin phrase ex nihilo, which has been debated for 2,000 years, is showing up in our science. That at some point there was nothing and then there was everything. And there's not much explanation behind that outside of something outside of nature. Better term, supernatural. The very best science actually points to a supernatural cause. Let's keep cruising. Um, there's a lot of questions that if we go through time that you guys ask about the, the Old Testament, for instance. The Old Testament law. One specific question is in the Old Testament we have this God of law who seems to use the law and commandments to bring truth to human beings. And then it seems like God changes and there's a different God in the New Testament. And then another more biting question, which I really like personally, said how could you possibly be Christianity be the true religion when it didn't sprout up within humans until Jesus was here after who knows how many ten thousands or thousands of years of thinking humans. So how could you possibly say that Christianity is the true religion? Well, these are great questions. So we have to start at the beginning point and say, okay, do we have any reason to believe the Bible to be a valid text? Now, I would love to spend the whole 30 minutes talking about this, but I won't. We'll never get out of here. The reality is there's a field that I've been passionate about my whole life called textual criticism. It's trying to understand, is there any science, history, archaeology behind figuring out the words that we have? How were they passed down? Was there some reason to believe that they are actually the words of God? And I want to address two special things. First of all, getting to the New Testament is central to the way I view the whole idea. Of, is the Bible valid? Is the Bible authoritative? Does it tell us any real history or truth about who God is? The New Testament and I'll just tell you a very short version. I'm just killing myself not to dive into this, but I can't. In a nutshell, there has never been in all of history, you look at the classic works of Homer, you look at the, the history of Alexander the Great, you look at anything contemporary to the, the writings that we have in the New Testament, nothing touches the Christian scriptures. We have so many extant copies from the very first centuries. And here's the key point, that men and women went to their deaths saying, I saw a man alive after I saw him dead. You can kill me if you want to, but what I wrote is true about Jesus. Even the brother of Jesus, James himself, 
who the Jewish leaders to try to squish Christianity. This is after the Bible. It's not in the Bible. This is from external sources of the Bible. They brought James to the Temple Mount and they said, will you put an end to this? You were the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. You grew up with him. Will you tell these people he was not God? And he said, I would love to, but he was God because I saw him alive after I saw him dead. They shoved him off a 30-foot wall in the Temple Mount block and he lived, he survived the 30-foot fall and they crushed his head with rocks. The brother of Jesus testified that what they wrote about this man was true. And Jesus spoke of the Old Testament. And we've also found probably one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries in the Qumran communities, the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 40s. When we discovered this, it was like finding the library at Alexandria. It was like a scene from National Treasure. We went back a thousand years in time, instantly in the 40s. And we all of a sudden had papyrus scrolls and fragments and pieces of things preserved in a perfect temperature cave from the time of Jesus, taking us back a thousand years of our extant copies of the Old Testament. And what we found is word for word, letter for letter, every Hebrew letter was on the exact same page on every copy of Isaiah that it was a thousand years later. So what that shows us is that the people who believed their whole life and their whole religion was based on passing down documents accurately were very good at writing the letters in the history that they received. Now, did God change? Well, in the New Testament, it tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this question of how could Christianity be valid if it sprouted up only 2,000 years ago, those two questions are interchanged. First of all, Christianity didn't sprout up 2,000 years ago. The story kept unfolding 2,000 years ago. Because Christianity is rooted all the way from the beginning. The Jewish scriptures are part of our story. And the Jewish scriptures are primarily about Jesus. Now, this is important. This is a Christian worldview. A Jewish scholar would not agree with me. I, I recognize that. But if you look at the Jewish scriptures and you understand that Jesus actually addressed this question, Jesus actually said himself, he said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's talking about the Torah and the Pentateuch. In fact, he said, not even a jot or a tittle, not even a tiny little punctuation mark is to be abolished. He said, I came to fulfill them. I'm part of the continuing story from the beginning of time. Christianity is full of us. Jesus is the very best picture. In fact, the, the writers, the earliest writers, gave us this great picture. And in Colossians, Paul says that he is the image of the invisible God. God showed up. He showed us his face. His face. We begin to see through a new lens. When we look at the Jewish scriptures, we no longer look at them through anything except through the lens of Jesus. Because God showed up and wanted to tell us more of the story. Now, I would also make a couple points about the Old Testament God. It's an interesting thing. He wasn't exactly as hate-filled as people paint him out to be. Sure, could I take some sections of the Old Testament and say, what kind of God is that? Yes. In fact, some of my own questions are about how we understand the truth about what the Old Testament is telling us. But the God of the Old Testament was also filled with grace. In fact, he even had this strange prophet marry a prostitute that would cheat on him over and over again just so that he could make the point of saying, human beings, you're like that prostitute. You keep cheating on me. You keep messing up, and guess what? I'm still in love with you. I'm still married to you forever. Nothing will change my unconditional love for you. And everything in the Old Testament, from the slaughtering of lambs to the, the ocean crossing and swelling and the, the flood, everything is a picture of baptism in Jesus and foretelling that the whole story is yet to be revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. One of the questions that comes up in the New Testament that's pretty interesting, I, I love, somebody texted in and said, Hey, how come the genealogies of Matthew and Luke don't line up? What a great question. But you know why I love that? First of all, it means you're paying attention. They don't line up. They're different. One of them traces to Mary. One of them traces to Joseph. And there's some differences within them. There's some beautiful things about it. One of them that I love, which is contradictory to 2,000 years ago culture, is they list women in the genealogy of Jesus. Nobody would do that. It's pretty interesting because the people who are listed in the genealogies of Jesus are not exactly heroic. And if you contrast that to somebody like Herod the Great, Herod the Great actually had people slaughtered that knew anything about his lineage because he was so passionate about making sure that he looked like the purest bloodline in his genealogy. In the, in the genealogy of Jesus, we see prostitute women. We see heroes that are not exactly heroic. And here's the best part about it, and this is what I believe. I love that they don't line up. Let me tell you why. One of the greatest criticisms of Christianity is that it all developed in a few centuries after these first authors wrote, and that more specifically the Catholic or the universal church, the only church that existed at the time, had control of the Bible, and they changed it to fit their theology. They fixed it up and they doctored it so we can never know what the original authors wrote. But here's the problem. I promise they would have fixed the problem with the genealogies. The analogy I like to give is when I was shopping for an engagement ring for Marka, 
I asked the guy, he was looking through his microscope at this diamond, and, he, and I just said, hey, how do you know if it's a fake? He says, crazy easy, a cubic zirconium fake diamond is perfect. He said, there's not a perfect diamond in the world. An authentic diamond always has flaws. It's different, it's different cracks, different things, but a fake one is authentic. And the same is true of textual criticism. If all four gospels were word for word the same, if there wasn't some difficult things to reconcile, like the genealogies, like how many women were at the resurrection, I could list off about 15 things that are minor, unimportant details that these authors disagree on. I would say, time out, BS, somebody has doctored this, but they didn't. They knew it said these things differently and they copied it because it's what Matthew wrote, because it's what Luke wrote. It gives us great confidence in the authenticity that we actually have passed down to us what was written. All right, I'm going to switch categories because a ton of questions came in in what I would consider to be the idea of Christian living or ethics. Um, several of them came in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to address these, but I want to be very clear because the, the questions as they came in, some of them like, is it a sin to cuss? Is it a sin for underage drinking? A lot of questions about homosexuality. A lot of questions about relationships with Christians and non-Christians. I was overwhelmed as these were coming in and I was looking at them at how much they represent an American view of Christianity that scares me. What scares me about it is no matter how much we might know the truth of the unconditional love of God, His rescue plan for us in Jesus, the hope that we can have a life transformed, the reality is we can't escape how hardwired we are into a religious mentality. The bottom line is we want religion. We want rules. You want somebody to stand in front of you and say, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Even though we say we don't, that's what we want. We want to know who's in and out. We want to know what behavior is okay and what's different. And you know what? That's okay. But here's my concern. My concern is if you ever picture Christianity to be just about what's okay and what isn't, rules, religion, then you've missed the whole story. You've missed the central message of the life-transforming, earth-shattering visit of God to our planet. So I want to start there. And now you need to buckle up because it's going to get crazy. Um, I'm going to start with the easy stuff and then we're going to get to the, the really tough stuff. Is, is cussing a sin? Is, uh, is, is cussing a sin? Um, no. Um, it, it, it's not a sin to say a certain word. However, let me, let me make a point. Uh, Paul cusses in the New Testament. You may not know that. Philippians 3, when he compares everything else in the world compared to Christ, your translation might say something like rubbish. You might have a bold translation that says dung. The reality is Paul said the Greek word that was worse than crap. It was the most vulgar term for human feces. And I can't think of a more appropriate time to say that than to compare everything in the world to Christ. When I look at Christ and I compare this life, trying to decide which one I'm going to look for, he said, this is a bunch of crap. Except he said it more vulgar than that. Now, should we cuss? No. Why? The Bible also tells us that we shouldn't let unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. Why? For one thing, you sound dumb. I'm just going to be honest with you. You that go around cussing all the time, you sound uneducated. And it makes me angry. So stop doing that. Second of all, there is something about words. Now, I don't think one specific word, like, yeah, I could say a cuss word on the stage right now, and I have. And I remember my dad. I'm so thankful for this. I remember my dad coming into my bedroom, and I asked him the same question. And he said cuss words right there to show me. He's like, there's nothing in this word that's wrong, but there's something in our heart that's going on. What's the point? What are you trying to communicate? Are you trying to lift up God? Do you want your words to be something that lovingly honor people? I choose not to cuss. I don't say cussing is sin. I say I choose not to cuss because I want to bring the most glory to God with the words that I say. And I want to honor what Paul says. I don't want to have unwholesome things come out of my mouth. There's no real gain or benefit to that. Next question. Is drinking underage drinking a sin? Uh, by the way, this is, like I said, it's really tough to say, is this a sin and this isn't? Is underage drinking a sin? Well, it's breaking the law. You're breaking the law. Now, there is a difference between getting drunk and drinking socially. But it really is important. And I'm pretending like you're my children right now. And I'm someone who loves beer. And I drink beer. Except right now, for Lent, I gave it up, which is the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> but let's move on. Here's the thing. I'm of age. It's legal. And I don't have a problem with alcoholism. That's a, I'm very fortunate. I'm blessed in that way. Some of you in this room do. Some of you have been beat by alcoholic parents. It's a serious thing. It's a condition that ruins people's lives and tanks them. So I have to be very conscious and think about when it's okay to drink. And when you ask me if I think underage drinking is a sin, again, I don't like these labels, but I would say don't do it. 
Don't get, a, don't get a, a misdemeanor violation on your record. Don't do things that are going to hurt your life. And here's a better challenge for you. Do you need that liquid courage? Can you be a strong enough person to have fun without that? And I'm not just saying that to underage people. I'm saying that to everybody who loves beer like me. Do I have to have a beer to have fun? And I would say, no, I don't have to. And you don't either. We have so much more life and fulfillment. Now, I love celebrating beer. I think there's a healthy place to celebrate the gifts of God. I don't think beer or alcohol is evil. But I would encourage you, if you're my child, I would beg you to not drink before it's legal. It just doesn't make sense. And God tells us to honor the government and the structure. There's a reason for those things. So that's what I'd say about that. A lot of questions came in about non-Christian and Christian relationships. Uh, one was very personal and I think was basically asking can I break up with my non-Christian partner because they're a non-Christian? Because I'm afraid that I'm the only Christian they know in their life and then they will hate Christianity. Uh, another question was just simple. Can Christians date non-Christians? Well, I'm going to tell you, I, I take a different view probably. Again, you can disagree than most Christians. A lot of Christians will just jump to the verse that says, do not be unequally yoked. I think that's a little bit taken out of context and put into a, an American version of dating, which was never even in the culture back those days. They got to sign people to marry. It was a whole different thing. But the reality is this. Yes, you can break up if you want to with your boyfriend or girlfriend because they're not a Christian. You can break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend if they don't like camping. It's, it's not that big a deal. Um, and the reason I use that specific example is because I had a friend who wanted to break up with a girl because she didn't like camping. And he came to me and he said, is it so vain and dumb that I want to break up with her because she doesn't like camping? And I said, well, how much do you like camping? He's like, I love it. It's a huge part of my life. I said, I think it's completely okay. If she's never, and she's telling you she's never going to like that, and that's such a big deal to you, do you want to be married to someone that's that? And uh, he ended up marrying her, and he's miserable, honestly. <laughs> no, there's, it's a more complicated issue than that. It's not because of the camping. But here's the thing. That's one level when you talk about camping. What if you change the subject to the most central, important thing in your life? Because I hope that if you've fallen in love with Jesus... I hope that if that divine spark has come alive and you found out his love in your I hope there's nothing more important in your life than that. And I would think that it would be a very difficult proposition to want to marry someone who doesn't share in common with you the most important thing. Is it a sin? No. I know many couples that one's Christian and the other isn't. And, and the Bible actually specifically talks about this was happening in the early church where one person converts and the other one isn't. And it says strange things about how hopefully the other will be converted through that. The reality is, no, it's not a sin. You've got to get away from this idea of what's in, what's out, what's sin, what's not. The reality is make decisions about who you want to marry based on the things that are the most important to you. If Jesus is the most important thing in your life, I'm going to have a hard time for you explaining to me why you want to marry someone who doesn't share that in common with you. And it's not your responsibility to worry about if this person, you're the only Christian they know. Well, I hope when you break up with them, you don't just tell them to kiss it and never see them again. You still have a relationship with them. You can still share light and hopefully they'll see your insane love in the way you even break up with them. If you're not a cowardly breakup person, you know how to break up with strength, you can maintain a relationship and help develop and let them see how important Jesus is to you in your life. Great questions. Another one came in about holidays. These are all kind of in the, the Christian living question. Should we celebrate, the question said, these pagan holidays with Christmas trees and Halloween and those kind of things? And I would say, yes, if you haven't been here around very much, I'm kind of, this is a soapbox of mine, redeeming the holidays. They're beautiful. Halloween, All Saints Eve, celebrating those that have gone before us in Christ. Christ, the jack o there's so many pictures that are not, in fact, pagan. In fact, they, they get this bad rep as being these pagan things, by the way, that really most of them have Christian roots. All right, let's see here. Moving on. Uh, this one says, there's a lot of questions about what happens if you decide to be born again or invite Jesus into your life. And the questions specifically were, do you ever become fully holy? Because the Bible says to be holy as your father is holy. Jesus says that specifically. So should we become perfect? Yes, but no. And what I mean by that is, yes, we should, but we won't. It's not going to happen. You're never going to meet an 85-year-old or 95-year-old follower of Christ that's now perfect yet. They will someday become that. In fact, there was another question about how this whole life works after you meet Christ. And I want you to catch this beautiful picture because it's, the theological terms are pretty uh, simple. 
The, the idea is that when we f- accept the fact that God unconditionally loves us and that Jesus paid for our sins, there's this, this theological term called justification, which is easily remembered as justified, never done something. Jesus sees you as white as snow because he has paid for our sin. But that doesn't mean you're holy. That's the next theological term, sanctification, which just means to become holy. It's a process. And it's what some theologians call an inaugurated state. Think about a president who's been inaugurated but is not yet president. He knows he's going to be the president of the United States. He's just not yet there. He's preparing. He's getting ready to be the president. And that's kind of the state we're in. We're already in. God has paid the price and made it so that we get heaven. We get life to the full. We get eternal life. We get resurrection. We get all of that. But we're just not there yet. We're getting ready. We're being transformed completely. In fact, there's a really great picture Jesus talks about often the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, the kingdom of God in the other gospels. And the idea is that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are more like interwoven with our reality instead of some far off Greek place. And that there's places where we break through and taste it, but there will be a day when heaven and earth completely collide. When everything will be made right, justice, love, it all comes together and heaven actually reigns. Not some mystical heart cloud place, but God. His love, his vision, his redemption, his resurrection, our life completely changed. Now, there's a question in the process of this in another category. Several questions came in about the church and its role in this. So we've been justified. We're trying to become more holy. How does community play into that? How does church? There were several specific questions about Catholicism I want to address briefly. First of all, there was a lot of questions about is Catholicism the same as what we at the commons here believe and some of the beliefs specifically about Catholicism with infant baptism and separate things. And first of all, I'll give an overarching statement that yes, Catholicism is what we believe. Catholics, the doctrine of the Catholics is the same as ours. That God became man. He rescued us in the person of Jesus Christ. Just like any denomination, there are probably differences than what some of us believe in this room, but they're not core theological differences. Now, are there Catholics in the world that represent nothing that we believe? Yes, but there's also Protestants in this world that represent nothing of what we believe. There's, there's forms of Catholicism in South America that are almost Hinduism. They have 20,000 gods. It's not even, you can even recognize it, but there's also Catholics who are vibrantly alive in the love of Jesus, just like you and I. We are the same church. The word Catholic means universal, and it is an honor to be considered in the same body of people. Now, have there been controversial things? Should the Reformation have happened? Yes. At one point, the Catholic Church, which it isn't doing now, was charging people money to be forgiven for sins. And people like Martin Luther and Calvin and the Great Reformation changed the world because they were bold and audacious and they said, we can't do that anymore. But I wish somehow it could have happened in the church. It didn't. And there's been a splintering of denominations ever since. And one of the core philosophies of the commons There's actually several questions about it. One of the core philosophies of the commons is that there is one church. It looks very different, but those people who recognize the non-negotiables of the authority of God's word telling us that he came and rescued us, we're all on the same team. We're all one body of people. We're all shooting towards making this earth look a lot more like God wants it to look like. As resurrection, changing people to look more like Jesus We're all on the same team. Now, some of you who are Protestants and Catholicism is such a a weird separate thing, you're scared because don't they pray to saints and isn't the Pope like God and all those different things? Well, yes, they pray to saints, but they don't pray to saints as if they are God. They believe that Hebrews, who talks a great cloud of witnesses, they believe that those that have died before us are in fact still alive in eternal life and that they can pray in essence say, hey, my brother that's still alive, just like I can talk to you and say, hey, will you pray for me? They believe they can shoot it up there. Now, I don't do that, but I don't think it's heretical. There's been problems with this idea of papal authority, the idea that the Pope has supreme power. I don't like that either. I personally think that's a bad idea if you ever give one person all that power. But there's Protestants who believe the same thing from their very own pastor. And I hope you don't. That would be a horrible mistake. So I just think that we need to be careful not to, we need to look deeper and make sure we understand how close we are in common with our Catholic brothers and sisters. Doesn't mean doctrine is not important. We have those discussions. Um, baptism came up a lot. Infant baptism versus adult ca- baptism. Now, I, I personally believe, this is my opinion, that there's nothing wrong with baptizing a baby in Christ because I, I have children and I want desperately for my children to know Jesus. And to me, I personally see that as more of a, hey, I'm going to raise this child in the best way I can to find the hope and life and love of Jesus. But I also would hope that there's a point where they recognize in their own free will and decide, you know what, God has enacted this love in me and respond and they would want to be baptized as a picture of dying in Christ and resurrected but I don't see that as being a a giant deal really fun question came in 
I like this one. Maybe, maybe this was my favorite. So if you had the choice of a superhuman power, would you choose, of these two options, would you choose to have the power of avoiding all pain altogether, never having any pain, or when you receive pain, you could be supernaturally healed from that pain? That's a good question. Um, I, I guess I didn't really think about it. I just got excited about the question. Um, <laughs> but I think that what I would probably answer is neither. Um, because in some way, I think the second is not all that supernatural. It's a little more natural. Um, there is the miracle of scabs that form on our bodies and white blood cells, which are miraculous if you don't understand the human body. And there is an, and there is an essence and an aspect of healing that does take place. And there's this idea of supernatural healing, but I certainly would not ever choose the option of no pain. And this comes down to the problem of pain, the problem of evil. But I know very little about answering that with a solid question other than that. I know when I've had a steak, when I'm really, really hungry, it's so much sweeter than when I'm really full and have a steak. So there's something about the pain of that hunger that makes the reality oh much more sweet. And, and I also think there's something about this world we live in with a problem of pain and suffering that I'm kind of glad we didn't grow up in some toy world where there isn't real death, tornadoes, or wars because we would never know what courage is if there was no real danger. If we were in a fake world, there would be no real courage, maybe the highest of all virtues, maybe even higher than love because true love requires courage. And love truly couldn't exist in a world like that. So I certainly wouldn't choose no pain. Last question before we close up. This is a hot box for me uh, and a very controversial one. Someone says, do you think women should be pastors? Um, let me just make it clear that, that this is a church dividing topic, um, which is crazy to me that, that people decide I can't be in community with you anymore because we disagree about this. Um, churches certainly disagree with this. Christianity has viewed it in different ways. And let me tell you why. It's very difficult when we say that we draw morality from these texts. It's really difficult to understand what these texts have to say. First Timothy 2 tells us strange things about Paul saying, I would never allow a woman to speak in church. And he also says that they'll somehow be saved through childbirth in the same chapter. Um, but then Paul in Galatians tells us that in Christ, there's now no difference between male and female. By the way, a shocking philosophical statement in the first century. Nobody said that. In fact, there's a secular book out right now called The History of Thought. It's about world philosophy. It's by an agnostic philosopher named Luke Perry. And he, who does not believe in God or Christianity, believes that those writings of Paul in the first century and the sayings of Jesus and the way he treated women revolutionized Western culture. He said nobody else before Christianity thought a man and a woman are the same. In fact, we even see after Jesus came in the Gnostic Gospels, in the Gospel of Thomas, not in the Bible, we see that Jesus is even saying, well, Mary can get into heaven if I make her into a man. We see that the believers, even after Jesus came, in the communities of the world just couldn't wrap their mind around what Paul said. In Christ, there's not a difference between a man and a woman. They're all God's glory. And there's even more difficult texts. Romans 16 Paul specifically says that a woman named Junia is great, maybe even greatest among the apostles. Now, many of your translations will change her name to Junius, but all of the early textual copies we have was clearly a female name, Junia, at the highest level of leadership, apostle. Jesus approached a woman he should never be talking to, a loose woman who had five husbands alone. He should never have been speaking to her as a Jewish man, but he spoke to her. He loved her and he sent her back to her Samaritan village. And John 4 tells us that the entire village believed that Jesus was the son of God and savior of the world. In fact, to my knowledge, it's the first community of people that believe in who Jesus was. And it says specifically in John 4, because of her testimony. So is it that women can be missionaries but not pastors? Is there some way that we culturally interpret if women can braid their hair or cover their heads when they pray? Because that's all in there too. And I would just say that my personal view is if we're too fundamentalistic literal, if we're not careful, we're going to have a difficult time and we might miss how incredible it was that Jesus and the earlier followers lifted up women in a culture that didn't even consider them valuable to vote. Consider them on the same level as animals. I love that. 
I personally, and this is my opinion, please disagree, it's fine. I personally believe women can be pastors. I believe when Paul said those things, he had very good reasons that he didn't let women teach in the church. Maybe because he understood the hatred at the time. But I don't believe that that's a representative morality that the Bible teaches. In the same way that I don't think the Bible teaches that slavery is okay just because Paul addresses slaves and slave owners. That doesn't insinuate that slavery is okay. It means that there were slaves and slave owners. And he wanted to let them know because he considered them equal with free people how to know Jesus. So I personally believe that it's a very uh, great question, but I personally believe Jesus is crazy about women. If you're a girl, I think Jesus loves you. I think you should dream big. And I hope my daughters dream big and I hope they change the world. Last question. Someone asked, and it, it's funny because it's a question that was asked to Jesus in the most famous Bible verse of all time that you all know. Um, but someone asked, what does it mean to be born again? And it's awesome because that's John 3. It's Nicodemus. This Pharisee who's struggling with his religious side and he's hearing this radical teacher, this radical rabbi, and he goes to him and, and he's asking these questions because Jesus says you have to be born again. And he says, how can I be born again? And Jesus makes it very clear from John three sixteen and on. It's very simple. He died for us. Being born again means that all of us are dead in our sin as we talk about this moral law and all these do's and don'ts. The reality is we're all dead people. We need to be born again. We need to be resurrected that's what Jesus is about, is resurrecting us. That we'll be the most alive people. I hope that's how you view Christians. I hope they're the most alive people that you know. Because they've been born again. Because they've been born of God. Because they've understood God's love for them. That they're redeemed, they're seen as white as snow. And they live a life to become the very best version of the self to bring glory to God. As we close today, we're going to celebrate the picture that Jesus gave us to think about being born again and life in Him. And that's the picture of communion. It's, it's really beautiful as you track the early church. I'm really fascinated with the, the early developments that went on. The two things that are by far the most consistent are the sacraments of the Eucharist or the, the Lord's table or communion, whatever you want to call it, and the idea of baptism, being buried with Christ and resurrected again. And in communion, the early believers of the church believed that there was some sort of special connection where Jesus was actually present. Because remember, these guys had seen Jesus alive after he was dead. They knew he was still around. And they believed that somehow in the Lord's table, it was not just remembering what he did. There was actually some essence of which Jesus was there. Later, a thousand years later, the church had its first great divide over this very topic. The idea of if the blood is actually Jesus' blood, the, the stupid theological term of transubstantiation, all these crazy things. But the reality is, and this is the way I describe it now, there's an there's analogy of this dancer who danced a beautiful dance. And this man came up to her afterwards and said, what did your dance mean? And she said, well, if I could put that into words, I wouldn't have danced it. And I think the same is somewhat true outside of all the theological terms of the sacraments of taking the elements, the bread, the wine, the grape juice, or being baptized, this great sacrament. There's something that happens that can't be put into theological terms. We're remembering the only hope that we have, that God showed up, that God's story can become our story, that we can become part of the great resurrection. We can be the ones that redeem this planet. We can be the ones that are the most alive people only because God showed up and he made a way through his body and his blood. So if you haven't been here before, if you're a follower of Christ, we have four stations where you can remember the Lord. Let me pray for our time and we'll sing. God, I want to thank you again for the freedom uh, that you're a God who can handle questions and God I want to acknowledge and confess to you that I know I got some of them wrong um, and I just pray you just erase those from people's memories and things that anything that would have um, deflected people from your truth about how you want us to live and how you want us to be alive but God I just do pray for the simplicity of the things that we know to our death that you are our only hope. That we are filled with sin. I am filled with sin, God. And you are my only hope. And Lord, I pray for this time of communion. That we will commune with each other. And more importantly, that we will commune with you. God, in some way that we can't articulate, that you will be with us. The real you. And it will transform who we are. Pray over these elements and we thank you for your body and blood in Jesus' name.